Hello, everyone. Sound check. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Let me get to my slides. Thank you. Loud and clear. OK. Thank you. Uh, tell me if it's not loud and clear uh, from now on. Thank you for uh, the introduction. I'm really excited to present uh, that uh, well that keynote and uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, how the cake tastes, give you some flavor of uh, the cake we um, produce at uh, Passbolt. I am going to, uh, this is a short overview of the presentation. So I'll introduce uh, who we are and what we do. I'll give some code insights. We'll be talking about architecture, about uh, local. We translated Passbolt, I'll talk about it. I'll talk about uh, the GWT authentication we've implemented about middlewares, about dependency injection. I'll introduce some tasting, testing tools, which taste good, uh, the test suite light and the fixture factories. So Passbolt, in a nutshell, uh, Vault is an open source uh, password manager for teams. So if you have a, a team and uh, passwords, you'll be very soon confronted uh, to the, the problem well, to, to share them, to manage them, to update them. So Passball is the tool for that. Uh, about us, so we are based in Luxembourg. I am myself sitting in Berlin right now, but we've got people uh, all around Europe. But the main seat is in Luxembourg. We are 18 guys and girls. We have over 100,000 users so far, and the number is increasing constantly. We're open source. This is uh, the link to the repository, the Passball API. Uh, it's based, uh, the technology behind uh, the password encryption is uh, OpenGPG, so it's all open source. We have a self-hosted solution, so you can host it yourself. We have uh, an enterprise um, solution, which um, allows us to, to, to have lunch breaks and eat. Uh, we have a cloud-hosted solution. So Passbolt API, it's a RESTful, RESTful API. Uh, on the front end, we have a, a web extension for Chrome and Firefox. And we have a mobile app that is in the pipes and should be out uh, very soon. Our code is, uh, well, test-driven, security-driven, obviously, uh, considering the domain we, uh, we deal with. And it's open source-driven, so we really uh, believe in uh, having the code accessible to everyone, which is a benefit for, uh, for the community and for us because we get inputs and uh, that's, this allows, uh, allows us to, to, to keep uh, quality. A bit about the team. I think it's really important before you build a, a project and this is what Rebi Berto actually told me at the very beginning I was here. You need the right people. So who is there? We have uh, three technical leaders, which is uh, Remy, Kevin and Cedric, the guys that founded uh, Passbolt, they have their hands on the code, so they take the decisions. But if we have a technical problem, they're always there to put their hands in it. This is really valuable. We have a project manager. It's central. It's really nice to have someone that has the overview and uh, handles the, the project management. We have a designer, which is great. We have uh, one guy doing support. And uh, this guy, well, he's going to uh, dig into problems and uh, help uh, help our customers, be them uh, enterprise or community people. We have the community, which is a big part of our team. So we are many people. We have uh, an HR marketing and customer uh, support uh, department, which is also very important. Without them, nothing is possible. And on the technical side, we have two uh, back-end uh, developers. One is uh, myself and we have Jeremy who just joined. We have two front end guys who deal uh, with the extension and we have two uh, system uh, operators. So the guys who uh, handle uh, the deployments and uh, these things, very important guys too. So this is our team. You can meet us on the Passball Community Forum. Uh, if I click on that. Uh, this is uh, yeah. This is the, the forum. So if you have questions, if uh, you have improvement uh, suggestions, or if you need new features, 
you're welcome to, uh, to submit it there. And uh, actually, this is uh, the continuation of Remy's presentation last year. Remy, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, presented um, Passbolt, uh, the whole technical stack. In this presentation, I'm going to go a bit more in the code and uh, present uh, the insights of the API. Since we're continuing from last year, I'll present the achievements we had uh, this year. So we've migrated from Cake 3.8 to 4.2. It was uh, not so complicated. The gap is not huge, but it's a bit of work since the, uh, the API is, is big. We had a successful security audit of the API by, uh, by some agency, external agencies, who uh, just detected two minor uh, little security leaks uh, on two endpoints that we could, uh, could solve. So this is, uh, this is good and this is something we're going to repeat uh, over and over to make sure we, we match the, the top uh, security standards. We've had a very nice uh, contribution from the community, which is running uh, Passbolt on PostgreSQL. We, are, we have translated the website, so it's available in French now. Uh, it will be available in German and Swedish at the end of uh, the, the sprint, or at least at the end of, by the next release. We've implemented a GWT authentication uh, mechanism, which was required for us to develop the, the mobile app. We have introduced dependency injection. We uh, have used, started using the fixture factories in the project, and uh, we've uh, popped up our quality, uh, code quality by installing PHP stun, we're at level six. And Psalm, we're starting, so we're still at level four, but um, it's there. So we talked about um, translations. So as you can see, when you uh, use Passbolt, you have the possibility to choose your favorite language and uh, at this point, I wanted to show you the tool we use. It's a uh, crowd in. And if you go there, uh, when I share the slides, you'll have the links. So you can see all the languages that are now in the pipes. We have uh, English, obviously, or well, this is Indian English. We have uh, French and German, which are completed, and Swedish. We have Polish coming up soon. We have Chinese that has uh, did, uh, that, 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 uh, did very good progress lately. So you can, uh, you can submit your language, you can contribute to your language if you want. You can bet on who will be first between Chinese and uh, Swedish. It's uh, open to contribution. All right, so this said, let's get in uh, the code. So in the first, uh, Part I'll introduce a bit the architecture um, at Passbolt of the software. Basically, the soft the architecture at Passbolt is a cake PHP architecture. We believe that uh, following the framework uh, conventions makes it way easier for newcomers to to understand the code. It gives a frame. So I'm going to shift to to my IDE. So tell me if you can't see too well. Uh, but yeah, I'll just present quickly. We have a source uh, folder, obviously, with authenticators, our commands, controllers, you know, all that. We have our plugins. So the philosophy at Passbolt is that uh, every feature is a plugin. So, for example, for the local, for the inter internationalization, we've got a plugin for the GWT authentication, its own plugin. It can be bigger plugins. It can be a very small plugins, which contain only a configuration. So in that case, size doesn't matter, but uh, it's very handy when I develop, uh, to, for example, the GBT uh, authentication, I can uh, run my tests just on that uh, domain and uh, keep on uh, developing fast. And just in the end, we have uh, so some continuous integration tools with GitLab that, uh, that validate uh, the whole uh, test suite. Yeah, that's it, I'd say, for uh, the architecture. Um, yeah, I'm going to introduce a few uh, features we've developed later. It will be the opportunity to get into the code, show you a bit uh, how we code, how we use PHP. So the locals, 
what it is, it's actually a, a, a cake uh, feature. You can uh, translate uh, your, your, your website. I'm going to show you uh, a, little, uh, a little test. So I, I always start writing a test. We have a feature, which means uh, we have uh, requirements. The first thing I do is uh, I write a test that match these requirements. And in the second step, I produce the code that match the tests that match the requirements. So we use, we, uh, this is a small issue I'm gonna address. We had lately a problem. We, want, we send emails, we use the email queue uh, package plugin, the cake PHP plugin. And uh, we want to send the emails in the language of uh, the person receiving the, the email. So if I write an email and my language is English and I send it to a French user, shouldn't receive it in my language, he should receive it in his or her language. And the problem we have is that uh, the, we had, the, you, can send, you can send the local into the variables of the email, but the title is going to be in the language of the person sending the email. So we had to develop a little mechanism that translates a string into a given local. So in that case, my test is that uh, I have a local which is French. I set a dummy French translator. I'll get into the code and show what these methods do. I want to translate my string in the local provided by the data provider. And I want to uh, ensure that the expected subject in the language uh, I want it to have is matched. Let's get into the code. I have my little cheats here. This is the name of the method. Copy paste it. There we are. So we work with data providers, which enables us to write uh, many test scenarios. We have a, a local, so this is going to be the local, the destination local, and we have the expected subject of the email. Uh, the scenario is that uh, I'm, uh, I set the local to French, so I'm going to be the French uh, sender. If uh, the local is French of the recipient, I want a French subject. And if the local uh, of the recipient is English, I want uh, an English subject. And if the local is uh, not supported, we want to have it uh, in French because this is the default local in that case. Let's get that run. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to show you what the at messages to French translator package does. This is a way to mock uh, translators, translations. So I get my default translation to the local French, get the package, and I'm going to add these three messages. Sending email from should be in French, Royal envoyé de, and the name of the recipient, uh, and the name of uh, the sender, sorry. Sending email to should translate courriel envoyé à, and then I have some dummy, uh, some dummy sentences. This is an email in English. Ceci est un courriel en français. So this way, we are decoupled from the actual translations uh, that are provided uh, by, by, uh, by Passport on production. So you see all my tests here pass. So this is the, the arranged part of the test. I get my service. We work with services. Uh, I've got a local service which is going to translate a given string. So the reason why we, we do it this way, it's because when working with locals, Passvolt is going to parse the whole uh, code and going to look for these uh, annotations. And he will know that this is something to put in the PO files and that will need to be translated later via crowding. If we had here a variable, we couldn't uh, do it. So this is the reason we, we do it this way. And uh, in the end, I assert that the expected subject matches uh, the result of the translation. Just to come back quickly, uh, I didn't talk about the services. The philosophy at Spazbold is to have uh, slim controllers, slim models, and we put the whole uh, logic into, into services. And typically, if you take a controller, we have uh, 
we arrange them also by, by domain so that in the end, uh, if you take one controller, it's an avatar's view controller, for example, it will have one single action. So one controller, one action, and this makes also the organization of tests easier because uh, you have one test case per that action. You're going to have five, six, seven tests for one given action. So this keeps the tests readable as well. Okay. Um, so that was the first example. I wanted to do something really fancy. It's uh, first show you the CakePHP email queue. So this is a very nice uh, plugin. I'm gonna start it and um, we're going to do it live, but we could open an issue here. I'll do that after the presentation and just mention that it would be nice to have a, a mechanism to translate also the subject. A second example, uh, another, another test this time, it's a rather integration-y test, it's a command we have the possibility to preview the emails that are in the queue. And this is going to help us also to make sure that the translation of the emails, the content of the emails works. So let me go back into the code. And open the test. What happens? First, we need to load the plugin because there is some configuration into the plugin that needs to be run. I explain in detail what. Again, we add the message to French translator package, the same uh, method uh, we've seen before. We create a French speaking user. So here the factories come in place, we create a user because our users can have different roles. You have users, you have admins, you have guests. So in that case, I'm telling this user we have the role user and I'm going to provide it a local and uh, dive into it. What the local does is that um, provide it a string and uh, these are account settings. So the user has its own, uh, in, in his settings, he has set up a, a local and the fixtures, the fixture factories have that width method which populates the associations as well. So we're going to say I need a user and in the account settings association, I need an account setting, put an account setting factory and you're going to set the local to local. Okay. So now we have our French speaking users that is a uh, speaking user that is persisted in the database. We also need uh, two emails to make sure the translation works. We make a standard email. So we don't, pre we don't uh, specify uh, any, uh, any local here. And so it's gonna be default in English. And we make a second email with the recipient, well, that French speaking user. We persist that and we run our passable preview command with the option body true. So the body is also displayed. The body is also displayed in the output. We assert that the exist is a success. And inside, I'm gonna look at the first email that was produced and the second email that was produced so it happens to be in uh, that array one and that array four. And I ensure that um, the first email contains the dummy English email sentence and does not contain the dummy French email sentence and the other way around with the second email. So this way we've tested our controller, we've tested our, uh, our controller, our command. We have tested our translation mechanism. Let's just show quickly how we handle that. So we go into the local um, plugin. In our plugin, we have that bootstrap function and we're going to attach some listeners. So we have a local email queue listener. Let's get into it. And what it does is that before an email is saved, we check here that the source is email queue in the queue. Whenever an email is saved, we're going to look at the, the, the local of the recipient, of the person receiving the email, and we're going to pass them to the template files. So we have a service, get user local service, and uh, we get uh, the local of that, uh, of that person. And there is another 
listener, which is only in the command line because emails are sent via cron job. So this is going to be required only on the command line or in the tests. We have a local render listener, local render listener, which is going to listen. Oh, sorry, it's going to listen to the view dot before render event and the view dot after layout layout event. Before the email is templated, we shift to the recipient local, and after the email was produced, we shift back to the previous uh, local. So this is the trick to translate our emails, and again. This works, but this doesn't work in the subject because the subject is saved in a different uh, field in the table uh, in the queue. Okay, I think that's what I wanted to show you on that example. Um, I'm going to go to a second feature we've developed this year. It's the JSON Web Token uh, Authentication. It's not really baked with CakePHP, but it is a CakePHP feature from the authentication uh, plugin. This is a link to the documentation. It's very well documented. It took us really little efforts to uh, deploy, uh, to, to put that in place. Since Passball has its own, sec uh, its own uh, security issues, we of course had to add stuff, but as such, it was very easy to, uh, to deploy that. I'll get into an example just to, 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 to travel a little bit in the code. So if we have, uh, for example, a resource at success with GWT, so we want to add a new password. This is an integration test. We will take a user, again, user, user versus that. We have, let me shift to the code so I can click on things. We have a helping, uh, we have a trait that is going to uh, either create a user if no user ID was provided. So again, the factor is here, very useful. Uh, we have a service, GWT token create service. We create a token for that user and we set the token in the header. So this way we have a user authenticated in the GWT uh, manner. Uh, we create some data and uh, we post that so post JSON. So it's basically the post, it's the KPHP, uh, the integration test trait method uh, post with a bit of a parsing because we receive a JSON response, but uh, that's all. And then we do uh, all kind of assertions in there. What I can show you at that place is um, something we did with the middleware because the GWT authentication requires um, quite some things to be done before uh, the, the request is uh, processed by the controllers. We need to check uh, if there's a token in the header. Uh, we need to also to update the authentication method because we have a, a session authentication method, which is the legacy until now. And now we have a new method. So what we did is, um, let's get into this one. What we did is, this one is a GWT authentication, authentication detection. So it's gonna look in the header and if he detects a token in the header, he's going to say, okay, we are not using the session authenticator. Now we are using the uh, GWT authenticator. And we do that with dependent, dependency injection. So let me just go to the application, straight that. If you go to the get authentication service, which is a standard uh, method in your application, we've got a bit of setting here all around, but the authentication is defined here. You get what's in the container under authentication service interface. This is uh, initiated here in the services just above. So we say authentication service interface, we take the session. So anytime a user wants to authenticate, we're going to use that session unless the middleware GWT authentication detection, middleware detects that uh, we have a token in the header. So we shift, uh, we shift to authentication uh, service. So this services is an iterative method. What we do, we take the container, 
we extend the authentication service interface and we overwrite that with our GWT authentication service. So what we, how we did that is actually inspired from a post from KPTC that they posted, I think in July, where they were explaining, you might want to have access to your container outside of the application and outside of the plugins. And this is a method they proposed that we just simply took, uh, which consists in having a middleware. Let me go to our standard middlewares. We have a container aware middleware. Now this is a trait, a container injector middleware, which does just one thing, it is going to put as attribute, container attribute, the container. So you see there again, the, the middlewares, we try to keep them very slim. It's okay to have five, six different middlewares that do one particular thing. And with this, whenever we have access to the request, we have access to the container. So it's a dangerous thing. You wouldn't want to write in the container in your controllers or in your models. Well, in the models, actually, this is not possible because you don't have access to the request in the models. So for that, we have that uh, trait with, uh, which gets the container. We don't have security right now to say, well, don't try it in the controller. If you're in a, in, don't try it in a container unless you're in a middleware. That's something we could add. Hope it's, uh, hope it's okay to follow. But yeah, this is what I wanted to show with this feature. Uh, add middle, use middlewares, use middlewares to do independent injection. This enables you to decouple uh, the logic from your plug, in your plugins from the source and between plugins. And one little last thing I wanted to, to show is the way we load the middleware, which is really in the application. Yes, here. The, you, have, you don't have only the add method in the middleware queue, you can prepend things. So here we are sure that that container is gonna be put first. You could wait that a, a certain container was uh, loaded before another middleware, sorry, not a container, that the first middleware was uh, loaded and then apply a certain middleware. This is, for example, the case here. This is the GWT plugin. And in the case, for example, of uh, the GWT authentication middleware, we want to insert that after the GWT root filter middleware because we filter certain roots. So this, I think, is a really, really cool uh, feature from Cake. All right, that's it, I'd say, for, for the GWT. Uh, yeah, one other thing I wanted to, to show is uh, we obviously have security uh, concerns at Passport, or at least we are uh, concerned about security. And in the case of GWT, you might, uh, this is an entry point, this is authentication. You want to send some alerts if you detect some someone, either the front end client or an attacker is doing something that should not happen. So in that case, uh, when we authenticate a user with GWT, the, 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 the client, the front, is going to send a verify token and this one is unique and if a user tries to log in again with that very same verify token this is a security issue so in that case we're going to throw an exception and that exception is going to be a kind of intelligent exception it's going to send emails uh, let's get into the code All right. so we have and administrators, something random between one and five. And we have uh, one admin, additional, probably because we want to, to have control over it in the test. Then we have another user. So we make a user with a valid GPG key because he's going to perform a, a login. So we need to have a bit more data in that user. And uh, we have also that method with authentication token of type, authentication type, Verify token. So if I get into it, it's the same as before. It's just creating um, an associated uh, associated data, and we process that. 
So we fetched that verify token that was originally produced to that user. And we're going to post again the login with that same verify token that has already been used because it's already there in the database. In that case, we should have invalid credentials, but we also want emails to be sent. So first we check that since we have add admins, we have uh, n admins plus one uh, emails that are sent. And uh, in the email queue, we want to check that an email was sent to the user because he is concerned. Someone tried to access uh, to his to login as him, though it was not him. The subject is uh, the one of the exception and uh, the template. So like this, we're kind of sure that it's the right email that was sent and not uh, welcome to passport. Uh, and for all the admins, we do the same. We check that an email to each of the admin was, uh, was, was sent. I, I'm, I'm going to show very quickly how these, uh, these exceptions look like, but this is a uh, homemade. It's not standard, and I think it's not worth any plugin. It's uh, like say, a verified token. So we have a consumed verified token access exception which is simply extending an abstract GWT attack exception, which itself is gonna have some, uh, some methods inside that, that handle the sending uh, of emails. This is very handy because if we want to know later in the code, when this happens, do some modification, we just uh, check, uh, we check that uh, in the code where this uh, exception is used and that makes uh, the, the traveling into the tests and the understanding of the, of the code much easier. All right, won't get too much deeper into it, but uh, this is, we found uh, an interesting way to make sure that we, we block with exceptions all process and we have some security uh, behind it. Okay, and there was another email, there was another test, I think, we're okay with, uh, with this one. I see the time is running. So I'm going to pass to the second part of the presentation and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Vierge Noir. So we are uh, two, two guys mainly. There's uh, Nicolas Masson, greetings in Berlin or in Liege. Nicolas is sitting in Liege and I am myself uh, based here in Berlin. Uh, we started working uh, on some solutions to write tests more efficiently. We had really issues with the fixtures. It was getting really complicated for us to, uh, to, to, to deal with them. You can look at uh, my last year's uh, KXS presentation to understand if you want more insights on the pros and the cons of the static fixtures. So we've developed some packages, the KPHP migrator, which enables the running of migrations prior to your test, which has been taken over now by the migration uh, plugin of Cake. So if you're working below for KPHP 4.3, you can still use the, the, the thing we done before. Over 4.3, use uh, now the, the Cake, uh, vanilla Cake uh, solution. We've developed uh, another way to uh, handle the test database to, the, yeah, to clean up the test database. I'll get into it right after, which was required if we wanted to work with factories. And also there's a little uh, tool that is uh, waiting on GitHub to be used. We haven't uh, deployed it yet by Passbot. We're still uh, considering the pros and the cons, but it's uh, an interface, so to say, between BHAT and the CakePHP uh, integration test trait. And uh, I presented it last year, so if you wanna have a look at it, enables you to write uh, Gherkin uh, syntax uh, tests. Yeah. This is a quick, uh, yeah, showing quickly uh, in the documentation of uh, in the cookbook. So this is how you are going now to uh, generate your, the schema of your test database with that uh, migrator tool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the test suite light, explain what it does, why it does it this way. Again, I start with the test. Let's get into it. This is the light. Ah, this toolbar. Uh, to the test suite light. And this is, yeah, this is an end-to-end -end test, so to say, for our plugin. 
shows the process. So we're, in that test, we drop all the tables of our test connections. We suppose we're starting from, from scratch. We just started a new job in the company. Your test database is empty. We use the migrator tool provided by uh, GigPHP now. Create the schema. We make sure we have that method. So the table sniffer is the class. I can show in the structure here. We have sniffers, and these sniffers are the classes that are going to smell the, the database and detect where some uh, inserts were performed on a given table. I'll get into it right now. So we make sure that uh, we don't have any uh, tables. No, that's not true because the migrations were run. So we make sure that um, the dirty table collector doesn't exist. The dirty table collector is the table that is going to where we're going to insert the name of all the tables that were made dirty, that were touched. So the init. This is what happens when you start your uh, your test. It detects if the dirty table collector exists. If it doesn't exist, it means you just you are on day one of your of your, your new job. And uh, we're going to create the dirty table collector, which is simply uh, create one table dirty table collector with one field, which is the name of the, the tables that are going to be touched. We create the triggers. So this is a an abstract uh, method, for example, um, an abstract class. In MySQL, we go over all the tables except the things logs because we don't want to truncate uh, the things logs, obviously. We want to persist uh, the schema. And we're going to create triggers. And every time something is inserted into that table, we insert into the uh, table, I think her name is test light dirty table. We insert there the name of the table that has just been uh, touched. And that's it. There's not more, uh, there's not much to do in terms of, uh, of preparation. Let me get back to the init. We create the triggers. Since we don't know in which way the state database was at the very beginning, we just truncate everything and we mark all the tables as dirty. But again, this is happening only on your day one at the office. After that, you will have your dirty table collector created. We know that the triggers are in place, there's nothing to do, and the migrations don't run, so there is no warm up anymore when you run tests. And uh, how do we clean up the, the tables? We have in fixture, we have that trigger strategy, which is the cake 4.3 approach. We have uh, before. Before the test starts, we truncate the dirty tables. And uh, we insert fixtures because it's compatible with fixtures. If you use fixtures, it's going to load the fixtures. And when the tear down, 15 minutes to go. I know it's a little short, sorry. Um, at the end of the test, we do nothing. This has a very big advantage because you write your test, your test failed. You don't know why, you want to look into the database, what happened, did something, was something not inserted or did we insert too, too many fields? You can go in your database and do the, do the querying. If you insert some, perform some MySQL uh, queries per hand, in the meanwhile, do some inserts, the triggers are still working. So later on, when we start the test again, we'll, make we'll be sure that the, the, the database is clean and that only the dirty database, the dirty tables are cleaned, and not uh, all the tables truncated, which would have some performance uh, drawbacks. And uh, yeah, truncate the dirty tables. We go through all the connections, so obviously the test connections, and we run truncate dirty table. And in the case of MySQL, it's simply calling a procedure which is truncate dirty table. That procedure. It's a bit fat, so <laughs> this is uh, purely uh, yeah SQL, and we have it in SQLite, we have it in Postgres. It's going to go iterate through the dirty table collector and say, okay, drop all that. So this is not really cake related. This is why I completely understand that the community uh, I took had discussions with Mark Story said, well, this is this is too much management. It has too little to do with cake. 
Uh, yeah, okay. I'll check the questions uh, later. Sorry, I have only two screens. Um, but let's go bigger in the sense that uh, I have uh, initiated by Vierge Noir a package which would be a kind of universal test uh, database cleaner. You can see uh, the last commits were right after last uh, cake fest. So haven't been very, haven't progressed so much so far, but if you have a look at it, we have some connection manager and we have a cake PHP connection and a Laravel connection. So it works with interfaces with Laravel. It's very similar to, um, to cake PHP. And uh, I think I stopped my last commits were Symfony removed yeah, because uh, no time, <laughs> no time for Symfony. Good. This was. Uh, I'm going to talk now. I'm going to talk now. Thanks. I'm going to talk now about uh, the fixture factories. You've heard a lot about it. Mark's story talked about it yesterday. You've seen in the examples how handy they can be, especially for associations. I mean, if you use them just for creating a user, you're okay to do a new entity save. But if you start having some um, some associations with cases, put your business logic into the fixtures, and it's auto completed. Completed. If you have a, a, a decent IDE, and uh, it's going to make your life easier, I think. So I'm going to go again into a test, and I'm going to show a feature of the fixture factories. Not always easy to pronounce that. And this time I'm going into the fixture factory repository. Let's get into that test. So the, the idea behind is that sometimes uh, you want to create associated data, but they should remain unique. An example is that Passbolt, we have a table roles and we have an admin role, a user role, a guest role. And when I create five users with the role user role, I don't want to overwrite uh, to create n roles. I want the tool to understand that it's going to have that role, but if that role already exists, don't create another one, just stick to it. This is the feature that we are testing here, creating a country with a name and a unique stamp. So that unique stamp is, I think this is defined even in the, in the, in the schema, it, cannot, it should be unique. After that, I'm going to create a city with that very same, uh, very same, because it has this, the same stem, so it should remain the same country, but we want to over overwrite the name, rename it with a, a new name, second save. We persist that, and after that, we are going to make sure, don't get into it too much, but I, we want to make sure that the country uh, is the, the, is remained the same. We didn't have a second country, we don't have, um, an exception, a PDU exception, it should work. And the way you are going to do that, if you go in country factories, you have the possibility to have to add unique properties into uh, the factory. This will tell the fixture factories that whenever there's uh, something that's being created and it has a unique field, and that unique field is set by your uh, by by the, by the data you inject here. Otherwise, it's going to be random. If you say, okay, he wants me to insert something that's supposed to be unique, before I save, I'm going to check if it doesn't exist first. So this works with events, take okay, events. And uh, this is pretty, uh, pretty useful. I think we have it implemented if we go in the role factory at, at uh, Passbolt. Yeah, we have a unique property, it's name. So rules should be unique. That's it. And uh, so the tests pass, but I can also show you. It take forever. I'm going to show you right after that if we comment that out, it will fail. I can show you quickly how that works. So, a little bit of insights the factories, uh, their content. So, we have some comments. You can bake your factory. We have also an inline comment. Uh, we have a setup command that is now deprecated because we don't need any more to change the PHP unit.xml uh, file because the way now uh, Cake 4.3 uh, manages uh, that is uh, for us, it's transparent. 
it passed. And if you write again, if I didn't, if I comment out the fields. So we have some errors, we have some events. We have in the ORM that factory table before save class that is going to handle the thing I was talking about. Before save, we're going to check if we have some declared unit stamps. We have the factories. So the factories, we have the base factory. Then we have the class dealing with associations. We have a class dealing with the data, dealing with the data that is injected. So you can inject an array, but you can inject also a number, an integer. You can inject uh, another factory. You can inject an entity as well. So you can really inject anything in that thing play around with it, you can inject an array of entities. So we'll, you will understand, all right, I have three entities injected. I'm going to create three, say, users. Yeah. So I wanted to show you that uh, little feature. There are many other features in the factories. If you go through the code, uh, through the documentation, we have, for example, one pretty one. It's uh, the scenarios, which we're now using at Puzzbolt. So I'm looking to the tests, for example, if you want to, if you had a scenario where you would want to create N Australian authors, you would pass uh, N as an argument in the scenario, and it's going to create that N authors from country, uh, country name in that case, Australia. And the way you would call it, let's check the tests where we are using it. Yeah, so we would call the method uh, load fixtures scenarios. Put the name of your scenario. So here we put either the name of the scenario, you have to follow the conventions to see if you do that, or you put the class name. And uh, once the scenario is loaded, you know you've got a set of data. We use it in Passport for a, a multi factor authentication, for example. So we want a user, we want uh, the YubiKey to be required for that organization, to be enabled for that organizations. We want the YubiKey to be uh, enabled for that user. So it's a kind of set of data we want to insert in the database before the test starts. Bam, we just load the scenario and we can start working uh, with our test. So here we can see the test failed when I commented out the unique, uh, the unique test because he says uh, integrity constraint violation, duplicate and tree foo or key unique stamp. Right, well, I think that was it for the feature for the thing. Let's get out of the code. And uh, this will be my last slide. So I wanted to show you a little bit about Passbolt. Uh, give you the links back here on that last slide. So this is the link to the Passbolt API. This is the link to the committee forum. This is the link to the translation tool, Crowdin. Get your language translated. This is the test with light package. These are the fixture factories. And I want to say a very big thank to the Cake PHP community. It's really fun to develop with Cake. And uh, yeah, let's make it bigger. Thank you. I'm on. <laughs>